For a long time my dream was to photograph the northern lights in my home country the Netherlands. It is very rare to be able to witness the celestial spectacle as far south as 52 degrees north. After years of dreaming and trying I finally succeeded in February of 2023. The last few months you have probably heard and seen more and more about the aurora on social media and various news channels. In this video I'll explain why that is and why right now is the perfect time to try your luck. I'll take you with me on two adventures in the field, pick the brain of an experienced aurora chaser from Scotland and share with you what I've learned about forecasting the aurora so that you will not miss the next big show. Before we head out into the field let's first explain what the aurora is and why we are seeing so much activity lately. The activity of the sun sends out a constant stream of solar wind. During solar storms the activity is so high that it causes explosions of plasma clouds to be launched into space. If these charged particles slam into earth they disturb the magnetic field of our planet causing them to be released into the high atmosphere and making it light up in various colors. The sun goes through a natural cycle of more and less solar activity. A full cycle from solar minimum to minimum takes about 11 years. At the moment we are well on the way to a new solar maximum which is expected to occur in 2024. So now is an excellent time to start chasing the aurora. In fact, let's go right away. Good evening, welcome back to the channel. Tonight uh, I am with Koen and also with Martijn and we are uh, hunting the northern lights at one of the famous windmills in the Netherlands. Koen lives only five minutes drive here so it was uh, his ID. Martijn and me arrived just a minute or two too late because Koen already has some awesome shots. Now we have clouds but we'll see what happens. Manage uh, to get any shots, Koen? <laughs> yeah, I managed to get a couple of shots from early in the evening. Yeah. It was only around six or something, and then it stopped. But it was beautiful. <laughs> At six, it was awesome. I was afraid I missed out entirely tonight, but then the sky turned red. So we just had an outburst of, uh, of the aurora. We saw uh, pillars in the sky, uh, or at least on, our, uh, on the back of our camera screens, uh, really red aurora. Um, but of course, we were super unprepared. We were just talking uh, two or 300 meters further away, and uh, suddenly we saw something on our screen and we decided we wanted, uh, we wanted other compositions. And uh, yeah, while shooting and looking for compositions, we, I think we all shot something, but uh, maybe it's not the best, but hey, still we got something. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, hang around for uh, another yeah, half an hour maybe. And uh, after that we'll uh, pack in and uh, yeah, let's see if it uh, works. <laughs> and otherwise uh, we just call ourselves amateurs. <laughs> it doesn't work out all the time, but uh, hey, that's also part of the game. So here is my shot of the second show we got later that evening. It turned out much better than I'd hoped. However, I was still a bit disappointed in myself that I missed the earlier show just because I didn't know when to go out. Here you can see Koen's result from that moment. After missing out on the big show earlier that evening, I decided to educate myself on aurora forecasting. After weeks of research, I am merely beginning to understand the physics behind it, so please correct me in the comments if I say something weird. However, here is what I have learned so far. At low or mid latitudes we don't get to see the northern lights very often, as is the case for example in northern Norway, Iceland or Alaska. We normally need higher than average solar wind activity. Especially earth directed CMEs or coronal mass ejections are often the cause of visible auroras further south. CMEs are large expulsions of plasma and magnetic field from the sun's corona. You can monitor the most recent CMEs on websites like spaceweatherlife.com. Please note that a CME is not the same as a solar flare. A solar flare alone does not emit the stuff we need for an aurora show. Very large flares can however be accompanied by a CME. A CME is not always Earth directed, but if it is, it can take somewhere from 1 to 4 days of traveling through interplanetary space before it reaches our planet. There are models which try to forecast the direction of the solar wind and the time it will hit Earth. 
One of these models is WSA Enlil, which is available on the Space Enthusiast dashboard of NOAA. But it is also integrated in various Aurora forecasting apps like Arcticon's Aurora Forecast. These models, however, are to be taken with a large grain of salt. There are a lot of uncertain factors which can cause CME to hit Earth 12 hours before and after the forecast, or not even at all. We have more certainty that a plasma cloud will hit Earth once it is picked up by the readings of L1 satellites. These are positioned relatively close to Earth between our planet and the Sun. Depending on the solar wind speed, they detect something is about to slam Earth's magnetosphere in about 60 minutes. On the NOAA dashboard you can find the L1 readings of the A satellite, while data from Discover is integrated into the Articans app. There are four important aspects of the solar wind that are measured. They do not give a certainty of an aurora show, but they can give us an idea of what we might expect. The first is the speed. The higher the speed, the more likely something can up in our atmosphere. The density says something about how dense the wind is. The higher the value, the more chance of intense auroral activity. The L1 satellites also measure the force of the magnetic field in BT. A higher value is better. Last but not least is the direction of the magnetic field, also called BZ. The best way to explain is by imagining two magnets. The same polarity on both magnets push each other away, while opposite poles attract. You're looking for a negative BC, which can cause the auroral oval to expand further south the longer and stronger the BZ remains negative. Based on various data, there is also the Ovation model available. It predicts the chance of visible aurora over the globe in the coming hour. It gives an estimation, but is not always super accurate. The model can also be found on the NOAA dashboard as well as in various phone apps. You might have noticed I left out the KP index, which many people use to forecast the aurora. Various experts advise against using the KP for forecasting. Partly because it shows in very rough 3 hours averages what happened in the past, which is not necessarily a good indicator for future events. Well, I can understand that all this information might be a bit overwhelming. Since I am an analytical person, I am used to working with data and I like it. I know however that experience is also a big part of successful aurora chasing. Experience which I just don't have yet. I decided to call a much more seasoned aurora chaser from Scotland and pick his brain. I will release the full interview separately as bonus content, but here are some of the best insights I gained during our talk. All right, so good evening there, Andrew. Uh, thanks in the first place for taking the time, um, yeah, for me, for my audience uh, to explain something about forecasting the aurora. But before we dive in, can you introduce yourself? Uh, so yeah, I'm Andrew. I do, it's called like Scotland's Night Sky on like Facebook and YouTube and stuff. So I do astro vlogs on uh, YouTube. I try to do it every month as best I can. Mm -hmm. Some months are pretty hectic, but yeah, travel around Scotland, appreciating Scotland's dark skies. Thankfully, we get quite a lot of northern lights. And um, yeah, just, yeah, everything Scotland, everything Scotland night sky, I try and capture it. During our talk, we discussed various subjects. One of the most insightful things Andrew shared was the special importance of the BZ value at lower latitudes. And mm -hmm. if you just think of the aurora as an elastic band, it makes it so much simpler. So this BZ line is that Aurora elastic band. Right. Um, so when the plasma comes and finally hits us, boom, hits us in the face. That elastic band around the, the Arctic is, you know, going to hold in a lot of energy. So it's only got one place to go and it will kind of come down southwards. So yeah. we've actually got a, a globe here. Ah, <laughs> How good is that? that? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's an Aurora, Aurora oval goes over the Arctic. For Europe, um, and yeah, so when it gets hit by loads of energy, the only place it can go is you know further south. Right, it's going down to mid latitudes. So for us in Scotland, we just need active conditions. For you guys in the Netherlands, you need pretty you know strong activity. Really active. <laughs> so yeah, pretty strong. But I mean, well, yeah, you do see quite a lot of reds as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so any for Scotland, we need this BZ line to go below like minus 10 and then we can see at our latitudes you guys are probably like minus 20 odd uh, so what this is is it just this bz line just shows you where that elastic band or aurora, aurora oval is so if it's up past like in the negative in the positive numbers it's in its natural state away in the arctic mm -hmm. and yeah you need to be in iceland and all that to see it but when it comes yeah. down to the negative numbers that means it's coming you know it's coming down uh, the latitudes so when it gets to minus 10, that's over like the UK sort of latitudes. 
And when yeah. it gets down to like minus 20 odd, it's kind of over the mid, mid latitudes. Another interesting topic was the timing. When can you expect auroral activity after the L1 satellites pick up the incoming solar wind? So obviously the satellite gets hit. Say the BZ line will go down to like minus, say, 20. Boom, that means, right, it's going to be mid latitude. The auroral oval elastic band is going to go around, down to minus 20 latitudes, which is probably like your latitudes. And then we're waiting for it to obviously excite our atmosphere. So it's still in space when it gets hit hit by the satellite. Mm-hmm. So we're waiting for it to, well, there, there is an earth line there, but it's a bit misleading. So when it hits the earth line, you think, oh, that's it, it's hit earth. But that's what I've yet. been doing. <laughs> Just the way, Yeah, the way that Aurora works is when it hits Earth, the day side, so if you see, you've probably, I don't know, you might have seen like YouTube videos and little mm-hmm. videos, you see how the magnetic field kind of like pings like another elastic band, it pings like energy. So yeah. when the plasma comes from the sun, past the satellite, hits the Earth, it'll smash into the daylight side first, so the daylight side will be all going crazy. We're not mm-hmm. going to see it because it's daylight. Yeah. But if we're at the night side, we have to wait. If you look at the top diagram of the Earth, the way the, ma- the magnetic field is, we have to wait for the energy to go all the way to the very end of the magnetic field. And then it, from the north and the south, the energy like meets in the middle and will mm-hmm. slingshot back and hit us in the night sort of time. I know it's a bit, a bit of a mouthful. But yeah, we're waiting for that. So instead of that Earth line, look a wee bit to the left, and that's your real-time data. So there's pretty much three stages. You see the BZ line going down. That means you've got an, an hour before it hits Earth. It's hitting Earth. The whole atmosphere is getting excited on the daylight side. It has to go a wee bit past Earth to go you know, past Earth, and then it gets slingshotted back to Earth. So our what's happening real-time, if you're under the night sky, what's happening real-time is you know, maybe a couple of, you know, centimeters away from that earth line is what's happening real time and where where that bz where that elastic band is uh latitude wise if that makes any sense so just treat the bz line as as the where it is in latitudes so zero is arctic minus 10 is britain minus 20 is like netherlands and that's it and just look after the earth and i mean that is it like literally friday night I used this graph Um it went all the way down, set up a time lapse, captured it, perfectly timed. And then I saw it, the BZ line went away back up north, back green. So I knew it would go away. So stops. yeah, so perfectly, yeah, perfectly in an hour's time when I saw it on the graph, it went away. So then I knew it was time to like relocate. So I went back and then I saw the BZ line going back down. So yet again, an hour's time went out, boom, it was all happening over us. Thank you. This was very informative. Um, just in case people missed it, where can I find you on social media, etc.? Hey, so Scotland's Night Sky on YouTube mm-hmm. and Facebook, and then Instagram's more like behind the scenes sort of thing. So it's just Andrew, yeah, Alan twenty two, and okay. yeah, just all things Scotland. I've also got a wee book out, Scotland's Night ah, Sky. Nice, <laughs> brilliant, which is quite good. It's done really well, and it's just showcasing. Um, it's even about how to forecast northern lights and stuff in Scotland as well. Excellent. With my freshly acquired knowledge, I started checking the solar wind activity on a daily basis. So after the next large CME outburst, WSA Enlil predicted it was Earth directed. It was expected to hit Earth somewhere in the late afternoon until the next morning. It was nearly full moon and the cloud forecast was sketchy to say the least. But you've gotta be in it to win it, right? So when the BZ line dipped south big time, I knew the L1 satellites had picked up the CME. I would have about one to one and a half hours before something could potentially be visible. So I headed out to a local spot and set up my camera for a time lapse. The moonlight was so strong that the aurora wasn't visible to the naked eye. However, on my video camera I could clearly see a faint green band low on the horizon. Yes, finally I was prepared. Although this isn't the best picture ever, you can clearly see the red pillars of the aurora in the sky. I was so excited. After it died down, I scouted another local spot for if the northern lights would come out again. That night they didn't. However, what's most important is I now know when to expect the aurora and know where I'll be. I won't miss the next big show again. 
I really hope that you have enjoyed the video and that you have learned something. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave a like and let me know your thoughts in the comments. For now, I thank you again for watching and I hope I'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.